Um, look, I'd like to kick off by um, congratulating MSA for putting this on. Uh, it's not a good news time for manufacturing and it's really good to take time out to consider the future. I'd also like to congratulate ORPA on the document it, it released today. I've, I've read that very closely and, and commend it to you. And can I also kick off by saying um, what I'm about to give as a presentation is, has been produced jointly with two re researchers at my centre, Green Maverna and uh, Serena Yu. Can I also start off with a, uh, a consumer warning? Uh, some of the following overheads have very small font. And uh, I, I don't normally have small fonts, but we, you do have the uh, paper in your um, handouts and I will be referring you to them. So thinking about the future, I'm, my first training is in history and I, I suppose I get um, somewhat uh, mystified about how often people think about the future. It's, it's not a continent out there to be discovered. Uh, the, the ingredients of the future are already with us and for me the challenge is how do we make sense of what we already know to give us the capacity to navigate what's coming up. And so th this is behind um, my presentation today. The issue isn't why is Australia so far behind and why aren't we up with the world's best. I think that is an extremely unhelpful set of quest uh, unhelpful questions set to pose. It's far better to ask what have we got to work with? And that leads to my questions. Where have we come from? What are the key characteristics in the current situation we've got to grasp? What's on the horizon? And what are the implications for skills and workforce development? So I'll just quickly whip through where we've come from uh, because this is what we know. The decline of manufacturing is a proportion of employment. Bob took us through those figures. We are, however, not alone. That's data on what's going on in other advanced countries and you'll see the Netherlands, the UK and Canada have all taken a bigger hit in their manufacturing workforces than us. This is data from 2012, so the situation I think has got significantly worse in the last couple of years, but it is important to recognise that we're not um, unique. It's also important to recognise that these um, developments have not been uniform across the sector. And whilst most speakers this morning have talked about manufacturing, I think we've really got to recognise that some parts of extreme manufacturing are doing extremely well. Food product manufacturing especially has been doing well. But if you look at the next table, you can see that over, overwhelmingly the, the story is bad, with uh, pulp, pa pulp paper and converted products falling 45% over the last decade, TCF down around the same quantum and fabricated metal products the same. So while some areas are doing well, others are taking a huge hit. But it's not just differentiation on the basis of subsector. and can I say th these are data that um, ORP has pulled out and it's all in their report. The, the really interesting thing for me, and this is my first apology as a customer-driven presenter, I don't normally put up such gory detail, but you do have the material in your book. But this is a long way of saying, how has the occupational structure of Australian manufacturing changed over the last 30 years? And in a nutshell, if you look at those last two columns, you'll see that the classic blue-collar workforce, both skilled trades and pr production workers, have fallen 13%. As a proportion of employment, they've fallen 13%. That's been offset by white collar workers who've increased 13%. And nearly all of that has been in professional and managerial work. Now, the question then becomes, what is the key characteristics of the current situation that we've got to grasp? And I want to lead here pretty strongly with the notion that we've got to understand how manufacturing is linked to the rest of the economy and in particular how it is linked to other occupational labour markets. And to, to bring this to life, I want to take you through data on the classic metal fitter and machinists. This is a core category in the sector, absolutely vital to um, maintenance, but also been very important historically for retrofit, retro uh, fitting, uh, which was very important for uh, innovation in Australian manufacturing over the last 100 years. You'll see from the top figure that the number of fitters and machinists in Australian manufacturing has increased from just under 100,000 to over 124,000 over about the last 25, 25 years. But the really interesting thing is what proportion of them are actually working in manufacturing. 
and you'll see in absolute terms then their number has dropped from 51,000 to just under 40,000 and the proportion of fitters in machinists in manufacturing has dropped from 50% to a, a third. Now this to me is good news. This is not a sign of the, the de-skilling of manufacturing. It's a sign of how manufacturing is actually drawing on and contributing to broader labour markets. Now can I take time out and warn you that some of you will find the following overhead extremely offensive. Right. The, the reason I put this up, and uh, this is based on material that was in the ORPA report, but I, I spent many hours assembling this. It's not exactly as presented by ORPA. But what I've done, in, what ORPA has done for you in its detailed report, has gone through at a very fine grain and reported on how levels of manufacturing employment are, are set at the very um, precise occupational group. Normally you see data reported in terms of managers, professionals, trades workers. They've gone down to what's known as the two-digit level so you can get a far more precise insight into where the jobs are, are and how they fit into the economy. And when you break it down this way, you can actually start to break, you can reassemble the information around a more helpful set of categories. And these are the categories that across the top which are of most relevance. So we can look at senior managers and business professionals. We can then look at technical professionals and trades workers. We can then look at um, what I call logistics and material handling workers, and then we can look at sales workers. Now, the first thing that screams out at you when you look at this is the very small proportion of technical professionals. Right. There are only about 12,000 uh, industrial engineers. There are less than 5,000 scientists in the wine and the, the food areas. All up, those, those highly skilled scientists and engineers constitute less than 30,000 workers out of a workforce of 900,000. I mentioned before that there'd been a decline in production uh, and trades workers of 13% and that had been offset by an increase in professional and managerial workers overwhelmingly that was in accountants and marketers. So when we're thinking of occupational change in manufacturing, we're not seeing a huge shift of the production workforce into design engineers or industrial engineers. We're instead seeing uh, manufacturing itself building up its business professional capability. I can talk about this at length, but the, the other big thing I want you to reflect on is the ORPA data very helpfully points out what proportion of these different occupations are actually employed in manufacturing. And what is really interesting about this, out of those four categories that I've put up, in only one category is the majority of, the occupational, of, the, of those occupational groups are employed in manufacturing. In the other groups, and this is um, uh, uh, senior managers and um, business professionals, in the technical uh, professionals and trades areas, and in the sales areas, the great bulk of people working in those activities are engaged in other industries. It is only in the materials handling and logistics area that, the, that just over a majority work in manufacturing. This is, for me, good news because when we're talking about the future of manufacturing, we're not talking about manufacturing as an isolated segment of the economy. Do we prop it up or do we let it die? We're thinking about how does manufacturing Im embed itself and how is it currently embedded in these broader flows? Now, that raises the question, how do we conceive of these links? And in the mid-1980s, um, the Australian metal and engineering sector actually led um, the, na the nation in actually thinking about how do we uh, retool? How do we get people moving out of narrow um, boxes and demarcations and how do we give them a career path? And we've been studying this question now actively for the last five years, saying how well has this model worked? And the vision was, if you look at that bottom set of um, boxes and arrows there, the vision was that somebody could start off as a trades assistant, move on to be a trades worker, become someone at technician level and then ultimately make it to a, a degree qualified engineer. This is called the metals restructuring model <coughs> and was often associated with uh, Laurie Carmichael and the metal and engineering industry but it was actively embraced by the employers at the time, the Metal Trade Industry Association, the precursor of the AIG. I did my PhD on the origins and the evolution of this model up to the year 2000. 
And for the last uh, five or six years, I've been working with Serena Yu to ask the question, what's actually happened? And my sad conclusion is driven by T.S. Eliot. Between the conception and the reality falls the shadow. So whilst there was a very clear vision of enabling people theoretically to move up a career path, that has not necessarily come to pass. And we're lucky in Australia, we have a large data set called the Household um, Income Labor Dynamics of Australia Survey, the HILDA study, which has been tracking 15,000 workers for 10 years. And you can actually see how they have flowed over time. We ourselves have been tracking 8,000 workers over five years and that has allowed us to go back and interview people and see why they made the transitions they did. And having, so I can present this data for metal and engineering. And this is data for people. The blue is basically uh, the, the trades workforce and the predominantly yellow um, boxes, the people in the predominantly um, production process work workforce. And each little line represents a life history. So what we've been able to present to you here is what does a life history look like for a great bulk of the workforce. And you'll see that that blue work, that big blue box is basically saying if you've been a trades worker, you've stayed a trades worker. Very few people have moved from trades up to technician and then on to degree qualified engineer. Similarly, if you look at the further box to the, on your right, you'll see that within the process workforce, or the below trades workforce, there's been huge churn. People move in and out of that type of work. They don't move up. Now, this is very important information because we were able, through our Australia at Work study, to find out people who had conformed to the um, metals restructuring career path model. We could phone them up. We found three of them who'd started off as a trades assistant, become trades workers, gone on to be technicians and then become degree qualified engineers. We phoned them up. They were still taking our calls, which was a, a lucky thing. And they said, under no conditions let anyone ever do what we've done. It nearly destroyed our family lives. Yes, you can do it, but the formal structures are there. The informal structures of support in terms of time out for training, uh, to take uh, some time out for study leave, are just not there. And so uh, we've got to be very careful when we're thinking about reforms to the labour market. We, we've got to move beyond format formalities and start to deal with the substance. So I've given you the core facts. I've talked about where we're coming from. I've talked about what are the key characteristics of the current situation. If we're to think about the future, we've got to think about what's on the horizon. And when we th thought about what's on the horizon, we can blend what we know with what's on the horizon to make some sensible assessments about what's coming up. Now, we're very lucky in Australia because ORPA uh, produces its scenarios of um, workforce uh, futures, and it identifies in its latest report uh, four potential futures. The first is the long... T and th they've written about this at length, so I'm going to say what they've written buckets on in about in two minutes. The, the first scenario is a long boom, which is basically business as usual. China keeps on demanding our, our stuff. And under that scenario, manufacturing output increases by 0.6% a year and employment drops by minus 0.5% per annum. The smart recovery is that demand from China and India drop away, uh, but the economy repositions itself to uh, take advantage of a lower exchange rate. This leads to an increase in manufacturing output of 1.4% per annum, and, but still a decline in employment of minus 1.3% per annum. In terms of trade, trade shock is kind of what happened to Australia <coughs> in the mid-70s when all the other competing countries came on stream with exports, and you see this already in other parts of the world where there is uh, a rival supplies of our raw materials, and you basically get excess capacity. And under this scenario, output would go up by 1.9% in manufacturing, and employment would only drop by 1%. And then there's the ring of fire, which is the kind of horror scenario where the trade system basically breaks down, people become more protectionist, and there becomes essentially a more defensive world order. And under this regime, manufacturing does really well. It increases by 2.4% per annum, and output goes up by 0.6. So ORP has done that quite nicely. So you can see... Though, as uh, we saw from the CSIRO, they have this notion of what's possible, 
what's probable, what's preferable. Well, scenario, um, the ORPA people have um, done that very nicely. But uh, no criticism, Wolf, for anyone who knows me knows I really like ORPA. I think they're pretty gutless because I think if you really want a gutsy insight into what's coming to the future, you've got to look to no other place other than Royal Dutch Shell. Now, that sounds ironic, but Royal Dutch Shell has been doing uh, very important work on scenarios for the last 40 years. I've followed it very closely. And um, they have uh, become uh, far more blunt in their assessment about what's on the horizon. For about the first 30 years, they were very measured in their assessment. And you will appreciate that Shell's got to make billions of dollars of investment in um, infrastructure. So they're not playing politics here. They're just trying to get the best information before they make some really big risks, take some really big risks. And historically, they've got the best information possible on what's going on in the economy, politics and culture. But in their last assessment, released in 2011 after the GFC, they boiled it down to a pretty simple proposition. They said within the foreseeable future, over the next 20 to 30 years, we're entering a zone of uncertainty. That's what they call it, a zone of uncertainty. And there are either going to be extraordinary opportunities or extraordinary misery. Yeah. That's not me. That's a direct take out of their, um, their report. And I'm not saying this to be alarmist, but it's, it's saying ORPA's given us some nice framings, but I think it's worth taking them up a notch because... Uh, given um, Shell's assessment, the disruptions that are coming up are of a very profound nature. So, given all this information, what are we to do? I've taken you through where we've come from, taken you through what the key characteristics are, particularly occupational linkages. I've talked about what's on the horizon. What are the implications for employment and skills policy? Well, to make sense of how the labour market evolves and how it's likely to respond to the future, I think it's very important that we have a clear sense that the labour market is not something that's fixed. The labour market is not based on a principle of allocative efficiency. The labour market is more like a river. It's not like a fixed lake, it's not a big pool of people, it's a dynamic life force. And you saw that with those little um, uh, scatter diagrams I had that came out of the longitudinal data from, from Hilda. But Whilst it's more like a river, it's not like the Amazon with one huge surge of humanity flying through um, society. It's highly, highly differentiated. And so um, how do we make sense of differentiated flows? Well, we could say it's a bit like Warragamba Dam. There's a big chunk of stability with little bits leaking out to the side there, but that misses its dynamism. We could say it's segmented, because I've showed you the segmentation between the trades and the non-trades workforce, but that misses the point that there are in fact major flows within flows. You know, the trades and non-trades workforce are not cut off like a billabong. Some people were moving into and out of them. I think we've got to turn to the model of the New Zealand braided river to get a sense of how labour flows within particular segments over time. And the beauty of the New um, the New Zealand braid, braided river image, is that it shows that there is some clarity, there is some stability, but there's little leakages off and then little leakages back. Um, there are major trunkways, but there are deviations around that. But fundamentally, there is segmentation, just coherence to that segmentation. But if we take the reality further, of, uh, if we take the model of the New Zealand braided river further, people flow out of the whole braided river system altogether. So these are people who um, take time out to form a family or people who take time out to, to study um, or people who have, have spells of unemployment. And so there's movements both out of the braided river as well as within it. So what are the implications of this for thinking about the future? I think it's time to think in terms of flows and not stocks. We need to think about the nature of the mobility into and out of manufacturing as well as the dynamics within it. We've got to think about the volume and the contours of the flows. The volume of the flow is determined by aggregate demand. The, the contours are determined by industry skills and IR policies. And the key question then becomes, how can manufacturing help people adapt successfully to whatever comes to pass? Remember Royal Dutch Shell's put us on notice that there's some pretty big disruptions coming through. How can manufacturing help prepare people for that? 
But equally, how can workforce development elsewhere help manufacturing have the labour pool it needs to draw on if opportunities emerge in its space? And for my um, way of thinking, I think this notion of vocational stream becomes important because remember I've said I think it's more helpful to think of, the la think of the labour market in terms of particular flows. And you remember I took you through the highly disaggregated data that Orpa pulled together. If we think in terms of people working, say, within an engineering stream or a logistics and materials handling stream, a business professional stream or a customer service stream, we can see that um, how can manufacturing draw on um, people with these uh, domains of expertise and how can it help develop people with those domains of expertise. And when we talk about the question in, in this way, we can actually see it's not a matter of do we actually have a special policy for manufacturing? I think that's a dead end in a policy sense. I don't think there's an appetite in the community to say manufacturing is only 8% of the workforce. It, you know, for affectionate reasons, we want to look after it. My argument is more profound than that. Manufacturing is actually integral to the life of any economy. If any economy wants to prosper into the future for the reasons we've heard from the other three speakers, we've got to have it. But we're not just doing it for its own sake. It is producing a legacy that can be used by others in the economy and equally others beyond it can help contribute to its development. So when we do that, the key questions then become not what do we do for manufacturing because uh, we think it's worth it. It's how can all players contribute to building up the adaptive capacity of firms and individuals to ensure that they have the best chance of capitalising on the new opportunities as soon as they emerge in manufacturing or elsewhere? If we can get the question posed in those terms, and I know that's a very academic way of saying it, but this is a smaller group, but if we can shift the debate from turning a special pleading for manufacturing into a more general call about giving the economy the ability to both contribute to its renewal and to renew the economy more generally, I think we're on a winner of a policy. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Now, we've got time for some questions. And so where's our trained runners for the microphones? They're running. There's one over there. We've got one runner on each side. And any questions so far? Or will I start off with one? Um, with that shell document, how did they, you said they talked about extraordinary <coughs> opportunities and then extraordinary misery. Where in that does climate change come? <laughs> is that, uh, with regard to climate change, it's, let me be perfectly clear yes. Yes. on that. Um, Munich Ray, the world's largest insurance company, um, put in fact, the climate change into their premiums back in 1977. In 1980, I did my first story about climate change, saying the scientists think it might be real, it might not be. Never heard of this greenhouse effect before. In 1985, I said the same thing in my first book. In 1988, the climate scientists said climate change is real, we caused it, it's going to be bad. And we've got the situation now where the Murdoch press say, well, look, we're not sure what these scientists know, let's give a balanced view, which is like saying that every time NASA launches a spacecraft. Sure, on one hand, they claim they've launched a spacecraft, but let's give equal time to somebody who says that there's no such thing as the sky, that God just put an alabaster dome over the Earth and painted the inside with some blue carpet and put some glowworms there to pretend they're stars. That's balanced reporting. So assuming that climate change is real, where does that fit in with the extraordinary miseries? You can ask a question. It was your chance. <laughs> Um, look, can, can I say, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm not here to buy into a debate on climate change and Shell. There is no and, debate, it's no, no, real. No, 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 absolutely. <laughs> look, uh, and, and Royal Dutch Shell is, is just putting out a document to help make its investment decisions. As a, matter, that, as a matter of fact, they take the science as fact. And uh, what, and the, the, the two big shifts between their 2008 report and their 2011 report was the science on climate change, where they said we just cannot downplay this as much as we did before. And the second big shift was in the GFC. And they said the developments in um, climate science and the developments in economic policy and practice 
basically took a whole lot of stability out of the system. And they said in light of that, um, there is going to be <coughs> a major uh, challenge to conventional practice. And they said as far as they could see, in the past they've identified three scenarios, sometimes four. They basically said there's only two scenarios through the current situation. There's one of what they call scramble, which is basically just responding as each shock comes through, which is a totally ad hoc response, or what they call blueprints. And it's not saying one big blueprint where everyone sorts it out, but um, governments at national, regional, local level, uh, working with um, community groups and uh, other representatives of civil society, work out um, thoughtful ways of responding to the changing environment. But they, that's why they're, they're quite, they had the zone of uncertainty. I mean, it's yep. quite interesting. Oops. Um. This is all on the web, by the way. This is not um, classified information. Um, they actually map out um, the changing energy um, supply conditions and the changing energy demand conditions. And they're quite genuine about this. This, this is a, 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 an opportunity, a significant realm of opportunity. And I think to try and move us back to today's topic, I think, there, I think there are huge opportunities for manufacturing because it's going to be absolutely critical in responding to disruptions. The challenge is how do you equip your workforce with the ability to respond quickly to the unexpected? I mean, we know something big's coming. That's what Shell's telling us. Orpa is telling us this in a more muted and mm -hmm. politically acceptable way. Shell's just come out and said, basically everything you know is not going to be quite right. We're going to have to do things quite differently. The question I'm posing to those interested in manufacturing is how can manufacturing build up the workforce it needs to respond to these opportunities as they emerge? And that's why I took you through that notion of vocational streams. You don't have to start from a blank slate. The labour market, through its dynamism, is already creating engineers. It's already creating materials and logistics handling people. It's already creating salespeople. We've just got to start to see them in that way and build up those underlying capabilities. And say Australia doesn't get its policy right and industry policy and manufacturing does shrink further, that's not a waste of time. If you've invested in your engineers, if you're invested in your logistics people, if you're invested in your salespeople, they can be rapidly redeployed elsewhere. But that's not the framing we've got at the moment. And that's, you know, when I'm saying thinking about the future, let's think about how we can work with these tacit vocational streams to, first of all, make sure manufacturing can seize any opportunity as soon as it comes along, but if it doesn't, we've still left a positive legacy. Another question from the audience. I uh, wanted the back there, and the trained runner is running up to the back, hiding right in the back row at the back of the bus. Oh, clever. Uh, my question's in relation to that um, comment you made about the skills in uh, the growth in the business and marketing area, and not in the engineering and design. Is there any information as to why uh, or why that occurred, why it occurred in one space and not another? Short answer, no. Um, I think my, like I, I looked at this exhaustively in the metal and engineering industry from um, 1985 to the year 2000, so I can answer for that period, the first period. And essentially what you had with the metals restructuring model was a, a huge breakdown in demarcations and uh, a, a massive uh, increase in the productivity of labour because it could be rapidly redeployed. So whereas in the past, if someone's a forklift driver, that's all they could do. You know, if you're a, uh, you know, a, a C9, sorry, a, a, you know, a, a, a C11 forklift driver, that was, you could only D, be a forklift driver. But when you move to a C11 category, you could then basically be expected to do anything at that category. And that led to a huge, improvement in productivity and you see this in those data I had on occupations, the trades workforce took a big jump down because basically the productivity of the non-trades workforce went up. You didn't have to rely on trades people anymore. That happened in that first period, 85 to, to 2000. And I, the way I put it in my, my PhD is you ha basically had a better utilisation of existing capability. And that means that's often best supported then by better marketers, better managers. It wasn't actually raising the overall stock of human capability to get a higher level of output, which was the vision of the model. And it's, that's where you need your business professionals. It wasn't actually an increase in the scientific content or the engineering content of work. It was getting better productivity out of your production workforce. But 
you know, for the period 20 to 2014, I'm always in the market for more research. And, you know, I can give, give you the thesis for part one. I'd like to know what went on in part two. Because if you look at the, the data I put up there on 20, from the year 2000 to 2014, the trades workforce then stabilised and the loss in blue collar work was mainly in the production workforce. So there was a different dynamic in the last 15 years. And that, that implies that the skill content in the blue collar side is going up but it's in, in the, at the trades level, it's not actually going up to the next technical level. And, and that actually requires managers that are capable of mobilising high expertise. And I think we've heard from this morning, that's a big weakness. The, the, the leadership capability within manufacturing engineering is quite limited. And we've got to figure out ways of not just creating those jobs, but having enterprises that are capable of deploying them.